When it comes time to discussing a new dentist associate contract, this is an incredibly asymmetric negotiation. The practice owner likely has done this tens of times, whereas the new dentist often has not done this ever before. This information imbalance and different experiences can really lead to dental associates getting a raw deal because you don't know what it is that you should be asking for. In this video, I'm gonna lay out everything that I wish I'd known when I was negotiating my contract based on the experiences that I have now. I'm gonna first tell you how you can determine if the associateship that you're looking at actually is a good one. We'll then talk about what you should be negotiating for financially in terms of corrective work and holdbacks, right of first refusals, restrictive covenants. We're gonna go through it all. Hey friends, if you're new to the channel, I'm Joel. I'm a practicing dentist and an executive at bootcamp.com and I make videos to help you along your dental journey. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is are you even looking at a good dental associateship and is this something that you should be considering? So the most common mistake that I see dentists make, especially new grads when looking at dental associateships is they're willing to take on a job that is a new associateship role rather than as a replacement. So let me give you a scenario. Say you have a dentist who is crazy busy. They're working 150% of what a regular dentist should be working. That would mean they're slammed. They're looking for a dental associate to come and take on some of this workload. Well, how's it gonna work once you join on in this practice? If they're at 150%, are they gonna split it 50-50? In which case you'd both be at 75% of what a dentist should be doing in terms of workload? Or are they gonna keep their 100% what they wanna do and now you only have 50% of what a dentist actually needs to do and produce? So as a general rule, I think all things being equal, you actually should be looking just for associateships where you're going to be replacing another dentist. And I advise dentists against taking roles where they're gonna be a new associate if there isn't a ready an associate in place. Now, obviously it depends on what options you have, but I've consistently seen time and time again where someone goes on and takes an associateship and realizes soon afterwards that they're not busy enough. When you are looking at associateships, the biggest things that you should be looking for is one, hopefully you're taking over for someone. What is that current associate billing? That's going to be a rough benchmark as to what you likely would be able to produce yourself. If you're a new grad, you might be a little bit slower, but it's gonna give you an idea. And two, you wanna look at the schedule of the practice actually asked to go in and see what the schedules look like over the last three, four weeks. Do they have large gaps? Are there tons of no-shows? How are they booking their columns? What's the hygiene look like? And that's gonna give you an idea as to whether this is a genuinely busy practice or if the principal dentist is just talking a big game. Because remember, talk is cheap. It's easy for the principal dentist to say you're gonna be really busy, but the best way to know you'll be really busy is to look at the schedule and see that a current dentist there that you're gonna be replacing is incredibly packed. So once you've determined this is a busy practice and you're interested in working with them, now we need to start to work out all of the different parameters in the contract. So the first is figuring out what you are going to be paid. So dentists will typically either be paid as a percentage of the amount of production, so that's how much money they're producing, or alternatively as collections, which is how much money the practice actually brings in. So say I do $10,000 worth of fillings, that $10,000 is my production, but maybe there are some bad debts and we don't collect all of it, right? A patient decides I'm not gonna pay for the fillings and we can't collect the money. So my collections might actually only be $9,500. If I'm being paid on production, it doesn't matter what the practice is collecting, I get just based on what I'm producing. Whereas if I'm paid on collections, then I only get paid a percentage of what the practice actually collects. Collections is typical these days for what dentists are paid on. So if you can get paid based on production, not collections, that's an added bonus. But if you are paid on collections, you wanna make sure that this practice is collecting most of the work that they produce. Now the practice has an incentive to do so, so usually that's the case, but you wanna be seeing 95% plus collections, if not 97 to 98% plus. This way you know that you're not gonna be producing and doing a bunch of dentistry that you're not gonna get paid for. So in terms of the percentage that you're gonna get paid based on the work that you're producing and what the practice is collecting, in the States, 30% is often standard. Some practices you'll see would try and do 25% or I sometimes even hear about practices offering 20% but in general, let's say 25 to 30%. So if I do $10,000 of dentistry, I'm getting paid $2,500 to $3,000. In Canada, it's a little bit higher. In Ontario, 40% is the standard. But regardless of what percentage they offer you, remember that everything is potentially a negotiation and it depends on supply and demand. So for example, for my first job, because I went into the middle of nowhere in a town of 3,000, even though 40% is the standard in Ontario, I actually was able to negotiate higher and got 50% of collections, which means that for every procedure that I'm doing, I get paid 25% more. And then for my next job, because it still was a remote location, I was able to negotiate 45%, still above the 40% standard here. Now, negotiation is an art, it's not a science, and you don't wanna overplay your hand and try and get too greedy because that can come off as a bad look. 
However, if you know that there isn't a lot of supply and there's a lot of demand, you might consider how you can try and negotiate a higher percentage because this single-handedly, if you're in a good practice, is going to most drastically change your contract and the income that you're gonna make. Now, something that I didn't do in my contract that I wish I had was ask for some sort of performance bonus, some sort of ladder provision, or some increase after a certain milestone was hit. So whether after I've been there two years, my percentage goes up. Now, this isn't something that I negotiate in my contract. It's very hard to do after the fact, but it's certainly something that you can ask for. And the idea is that you want mutual alignment. You want to present it in such a way that if you hit such a milestone, it's benefiting the practice owner, right? So you're able to produce drastically more than you thought you were going to do. Okay, that benefits the practice owner. So you should also be compensated at a greater rate for that, or you've stayed at the practice for two years. Okay, associates often have high turnover. It benefits the practice owner to have had someone consistently. You wanna make it in a way that makes the practice owner feel like you're not trying to get too much from them, that, oh wow, if they really can do this, I'd be happy to pay them more because it benefits me. But it's something that I think is easy to work into a contract as a clause and really can benefit long-term for you as an associate. Because I didn't have anything like this in my contract and I've now stayed at this practice for five years and I've produced a lot more than the dentist thought I was going to be able to. And so I think if I had done this at the beginning, I could have been compensated more highly for the work and reward that I've generated. This is a minor point, but actually does make a difference is whether you get paid on hygiene x-rays or not. So when you're doing an exam for a patient, a recall exam or a new patient exam, the hygienist takes x-rays and the dentist who is in the practice needs to be the one who's ordering those x-rays, telling the hygienist, this is what x-rays I'd like you to take. And you wanna find out if you're gonna be paid for the x-rays that the hygienist takes when you're doing your checks. So in my practice, I don't get paid for this, but lots of friends of mine actually do get paid on hygiene x-rays and it adds up to be quite a bit. If you're doing a full mouth series, which is x-rays all around, or even just bite wings and some x-rays at the front, this can add up to hundreds of dollars over the day. And so if you're getting 25 to 50%, depending on what your collections is, of that percentage, it can really add up, right? This could be the difference of having a free $50 dinner every single night just because you get hygiene x-rays. So something to look for in your associate contract, although many dentists don't offer this to their associates. Sticking with financials, something else to consider is whether you're going to be getting benefits as part of the work, so health insurance, and if you have any sort of a daily guarantee. So daily guarantees are tough. I actually see them used in lots of places, which is nice. Uh, when I brought up a daily guarantee with the person that I worked for, he said that he never does it because it just de-incentivizes the person to work. And he said, who knows, maybe I decide just to sit on my keister all day and not do any work. Do I still get my daily guarantee? However, if you do see a practice offering you a daily guarantee, at the very least, you know that it's a sign that the practice feels like you're going to be able to produce more than that. Practices aren't in the business of losing money and they wouldn't offer a daily guarantee if they didn't think that you'd be able to earn even more money by working and superseding what that daily the guarantee was. So if you do see a daily guarantee, that's definitely a nice bonus, as is seen benefits in a contract, which not all dental offices provide. Other fringe benefits that are sometimes offered in dental contracts is whether they'll pay any of your licensing dues, your malpractice insurance, whether they'll pay for you to have continuing education. Again, in this idea of negotiation, figuring out what you can and cannot get, these are things that a dental practice could offer you to perhaps sweeten the deal and it's something that you can consider asking for. How often you're paid is another thing that you wanna consider. Bi-weekly is nice because you get money more more often. However, it does take a fair amount of work to figure out how much an associate needs to be paid, subtracting lab bills. And so it is normal also to have it only paid monthly, which is what I get at my office. Something that I did negotiate in my dental associateship, which I think is really valuable, especially if you see potential, is the right of first refusal. So what a right of first refusal is, is the opportunity, if the practice were to be sold, for you to have the first right to buy the practice at an equivalent price to what someone else would pay for it before it can be sold to someone else. So this is a call option. What that means is that it just gives you the ability to purchase the practice if it is gonna be sold if you want it, but you don't have to purchase it if you don't want to. And this gives you flexibility. You never know what life is gonna be like in three to five years. You don't know how the practice is gonna grow and how you're going to contribute to that growth, how much you like the patients, how much you wanna stay there versus try something else. So negotiating a right of first refusal is a nice thing to have baked into the contract. Some practice owners are reluctant to do it because it does make selling the practice a little bit more difficult. Whenever they have an offer to buy it, they now need to go give that equivalent offer to the associate, which can sometimes scare off potential buyers. But it's something that if you can negotiate, I would, because it's good to have optionality for the future. While you're working at the practice, you wanna know what vacation time you're gonna be able to take and how many days total. 
So often practices will have a provision for how many continuous days that you can take. So say you get three weeks of vacation that you can't take more than 10 days at any given time. And that's because the practice owner doesn't want you to go to Hawaii for three weeks and have no one there. They also sometimes like to rotate who's able to take vacations. And by preventing someone from doing it all in bulk, it's easier for the practice. That's pretty standard. But you should know the total amount of time that you can take, the number of continuous days that you can take, whether you automatically get time off during the winter vacation that doesn't count towards your vacation days. So often many offices will be closed from Christmas Eve through to the day after New Year's Day. Does that contribute to your vacation time? And also as an associate, when are you going to be expected to work? So many practice owners like hiring dental associates because that means that they can stay open in the evenings. They can have those associates work on the weekends. This is something that I never wanted to do and took a hard line against, but it's something that the practice owner might try and negotiate with you. And so again, thinking about what can I give and what can I take, if you're willing to do something in the evening, like start at 11 and finish at seven or work one weekend day per month, that could be a good negotiation tactic that you can give in exchange for something else. And also just trying to sweeten your package as a potential associate for them to choose. You also wanna know what your legal status is, your taxation status. Are you a W-2 employee or a T-4 employee in Canada, or are you a 1099 independent contractor? And often dental practices will employ associates as independent contractors. But again, this is something that you should consider because you do have different rights as an employee than as an independent contractor. This isn't legal advice and I'd consult a lawyer if you're unsure about any of this before you sign a contract. And now finally, let's talk about when slash if you decide you're going to leave the dental practice. Now disclaimer, this is not legal advice. You should consult a lawyer. Typically in most jurisdictions, a non-compete is not enforceable after you've left a practice. And so many practice owners will throw in a non-compete somewhat as a scare tactic, saying that after you leave the practice for a period of one year, you can't work in this given vicinity. Usually that's not enforceable because you can't deprive someone the opportunity to earn a living. So if I live in a city and I stop working at one place, they can't deprive my livelihood by preventing me from working somewhere else in a similar vicinity. So typically those non-competes after you've left the practice are unenforceable. Although again, this is not legal advice and you should consult the lawyer. While you are working at the practice though, it is more reasonable for a judge to uphold the non-compete in a certain radius. So if I'm working at practice A and I wanna go work at practice B, if it's a mile away, I can't work at those two practices at the same time. Again, you should consult a lawyer about this. So non-competes usually can be enforced while you're working at the practice, not after you've left but non-solicitation clauses can be enforced. And what that means is that after you've left the practice, you can't try and solicit patients to a new practice. You can't try and solicit staff to a new practice. And this is fairly standard. So again, while not legal advice and you should do your own due diligence and make this decision for yourself with consultation from a lawyer, I wouldn't worry too much about the non-compete for after you left the practice, but rather while you're working at the practice. Non-compete does need to be reasonable, which means that they can't say a 100 mile radius you can't work. Usually it will only be enforceable if it's within a reasonable amount of space, and then you can work at another practice if you wanted to somewhere outside of that vicinity. But the non-solicitations usually are upheld for a period of time, and you can't really negotiate against this, so it's something that you're just going to have to accept. And also once you've left the practice, you need to know what's gonna be expected of you in terms of corrective work and holdbacks. So in dentistry, sometimes work does need to be redone, right? A patient, you did a filling on them, it was large, it chips, and the filling is going to be redone at no charge to the patient because it's been less than a year. If you were still working at the practice, you'd likely just replace the filling at no charge. But now that you've left the practice, another dentist needs to do it. And that other dentist isn't likely gonna do your work for free. And so they want to be compensated for the time. And that is where corrective work comes into play. So typically there'll be some holdback that says after you've left the practice, we're gonna hold back X amount of money, $3,000, whatever, that is gonna be used towards corrective work. And after one year's time, whatever balance remains from that $3,000, so all the deductions for corrective work that was done, if there's any balance, they'll then pay that to you. So they'll hold you that off your last paycheck. This is pretty standard and something that you're likely going to need to agree to. I think overall, picking the right associateship is more important than trying to get every little thing that you want in associate contract. So if you're going to a busy practice and everyone there speaks super highly of the dentists and the way that things work, I would focus more on the practice you're trying to go to rather than all of the little details in your associate contract. And as I stated before, a part of negotiation is that you don't wanna overplay your hand. You don't wanna come across as greedy that can really sour things. 
things. So it's about what's reasonable. A uh, good phrase that I've heard about negotiation that I liked is that negotiation is won by whoever cares less. And what that means is that if there's lots of options for different associates, all things being equal, if you try and negotiate too hard, they could say, screw this person, we're going with someone else. Alternatively, if you're going to an area where there isn't a lot of interest from associates, you might have more upper hand in the negotiation and that will allow you to try and negotiate more from the dentist. If you're looking for dental associateships, make sure you check out this video I made on how I paid off my dental school debt sooner and earned way more as a first year dental associate than I ever thought I could. And if you enjoyed this video, please smash that like button, turn the like button blue. It really does a lot to support me as a creator and make sure you hit subscribe as I make videos to help you along your dental journey and I'll see you in the next one.